Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lynn Weil, Director of External Affairs for the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, or CSET, at Georgetown University. We're delighted to welcome you for the launch of a report by West Exec Advisors. A link to that report is on our website, and you're welcome to follow along there, but I'd recommend instead listening for the next hour or so, because this is going to be a fascinating conversation. In a moment, you'll hear from our featured speakers, Michelle Flournoy and Avril Haynes, together with our moderator, Richard Danzig. But first, a brief bit of housekeeping. All attendees' microphones are muted, and if you're joining us by computer, we can't see you. If you're on a computer and experience any technical issues, use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to alert us and a CSEP team member will help you. Don't use the chat for anything else just now. We'll come back to it in a bit. And now it's my pleasure to hand the reins over to our moderator. Among his many credits, Dr. Richard Danzig is a senior advisor to the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory and chair of the advisory panel for the Idaho National Laboratories Innovation Center. He previously served as the chairman of the board of the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments a member of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board and the Secretary of Defense's Defense Policy Board. Dr. Danzig served as Undersecretary of the Navy from 1993 to 1997 and as Secretary of the Navy from 1998 to January 2001. Richard, over to you. It's wonderful to have so many of you attending this event. I think it's partly a comment on the nature of the subject and largely a commentary on our speakers. Uh, we will have two speakers first, Michelle Flournoy and Avril Haynes, the co-authors of the report that will be presented or that are now public. Um, and they will give presentations uh, on this report. Michelle is the uh, co-director of the uh, West Exec uh, organization. And before that, she was the chair, the co-founder of the Center for New American Security, and before that, under Secretary for Policy in the Pentagon. She has a rich educational career, including a degree from Balliol College at Oxford. Avril Haynes combines the talents and training of a lawyer and a national security expert. I personally regard that as just about as good as you can get, but Avril goes a step further by also having a BA in physics as an undergraduate. She was in the Obama administration, the deputy uh, head of the CIA and deputy national security advisor. She's now head of the national security portion of the Biden transition team. So Michelle and Avril, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I, I really, um, we're so grateful for this opportunity, frankly, to be able to talk about our report. It's uh, both Michelle and myself, obviously, and also Gabby, who will be joining us on the panel. And really grateful to you, Richard, for being willing to moderate this, particularly given your long sort of knowledge and experience and thinking on these issues. I think you will have some insights that will really benefit us, but not the least of which are the wonderful panelists who uh, we had an opportunity to interview in the process of doing our work and hopefully we did some justice to frankly the advice that they gave us along with the dozens of other people that we talked to in this process. I'm going to talk about some of the things that we found and Michelle is going to talk about our recommendations in this process and I think really our work is grounded on the insight that an effective approach to testing, evaluating, verifying and validating machine learning systems is critical to our ability to actually effectively leverage artificial intelligence, addressing both the challenges that arise as a context, but also the opportunity that this technology presents. And I think, you know, we note in the report that we're in an inflection moment in the country. And honestly, in the context of this technological revolution, we're seeing how that revolution is exacerbating some of the challenges that we have in this moment, but also the opportunities that it presents for solutions to things in a whole series of fields, you know, whether you're talking about climate or food security or intelligence or in the context of DOD. And many of the breakthroughs that will come through the exploitation, I think, of machine learning and these advances will shape really the military and economic balance of power that we're gonna be facing in the future. And 
the impact that machine learning can have on the Department of Defense and its mission is really quite significant as we look at it and greatly improving the speed, the accuracy, the effectiveness of our military. But of course, in other areas, we're gonna be competing globally, not just in the context of the military, but in a whole series of areas. And as we do this, we're establishing standards for these technologies that affect not just the Department of Defense, even though the Department of Defense tends to be a driver for these issues, but also the private sector and other countries and how they approach it. And then those standards get used as the backbone in a sense for a testing, evaluating, verification and validation system in a way. And, and so we really you know, found that this to be a fundamental aspect of the ecosystem that we were trying to produce in order to be competitive and to meet this moment and the challenges that it presents. We know that we consciously want to promote the development of machine learning systems and in particular deep learning systems, right, that are safe, that are secure, that take into account privacy, that are ethical, while also achieving the advantages that they have to offer, you know, an effective testing and evaluation verification validation system can actually promote this, right, and is critical to actually seeing this work. And when we talk to people in government, in industry, in academia, we learned a tremendous amount. And, and what we talked about was really sort of what is the current system? How does this type of technology require something different? And if so, why and how? And what are some of the bureaucratic and, and sort of uh, policy issues that surround it that can either make it successful or actually produce challenges? So unlike most DOD systems, really learning systems continue to develop after they're deployed and are especially sensitive to being put into different environments and reacting in potentially unpredictable ways. And consequently, they really, and this is a theme that you'll see in our report and our discussion, but really one that we picked up from others is that they require an iter iterative and really a continuous testing approach. And this is something that, that came up on a regular basis that you know frequently in a, a standard scenario, you have a kind of a master plan for testing, evaluation, verification, validation. And it, it really is looking at sort of, you know, the system doing that, going through that process and then deploying it. And maybe once in a while, it might come back um, in order to do further testing. And everybody said, look, you can't do that with a learning system. That really doesn't make sense. This is going to have to be iterative and continuous in order for it to be effective. Additionally, interactions within and between systems can induce really unintended and unexpected consequences. And thus testing them in the field in the context in which they're gonna be used is often critical. So some pieces you can do for simulation, other things you can do is on a piece by piece basis. And frequently, you know, you see testing that gets done on a specific component. But here, what we're saying is actually, it has to be understood as part of the broader system and it has to be tested in that context in order for it to be effectively tested and evaluated and verified and validated. And then in the context of deep learning systems particularly, and this comes up a lot obviously for folks that have thought about this and worked in these fields for a while, particularly if they're not designed to promote explainability, what happens is unlike you know, previous types of computer systems, it just may not be possible to trace why a deep learning system made the decision it made in a particular scenario. And I've highlighted three aspects of how this technology essentially interacts in a different way in testing to really show you just one of the fundamental issues that is highlighted as the title of our report. All of these things add to the challenges to trust in these circumstances, right? So these are all, issues that fundamentally can undermine our trust in these systems and ones that can be improved through effective approaches to the development, through design, and through the testing and evaluation, verification and validation process. So that's a key piece of what we learned through this process is that there are some things that require different approaches and that those approaches can help to actually validate and help us to trust these systems more effectively so that we can use them in ways that make sense to us and within kind of standards that are appropriate. We also learned basically about the significant vulnerabilities that exist with these systems. So, you know, while they present extraordinary opportunities, they're more prone to adversary attacks and system failures than other systems on average, including novel issues such as data poisoning that people heard, you know, it's sort of you, you're changing a pixel and suddenly it doesn't look like a rifle, it looks like a turtle, or you have some other particular issue that address that needs to be addressed. And we also heard from many of the experts just how 
we're learning about where those vulnerabilities are, but the reality is we're going to need experts to continue to be monitoring that and understanding this as it develops, because we really don't understand all of the vulnerabilities yet and where those issues are going to come up and how we need to develop that um, into our process for testing and evaluation, verification, validation. It's a mouthful. I may just say TEVB. So we also recognize that the principal innovations in these fields are really coming out of the private sector. And as a consequence, in, you know, in order for us to be useful and in, in, uh, in order for us to deploy technology on a timeline that means that it isn't, you know, that it remains actually current, we're going to have to do this in a way that is relatively speedy and, um, and doesn't create a barrier for us in innovation in our mission space. But at the same time, you know, while that is gonna to continue to be a pressure and there will always be pressure on reducing the amount of time that you spend on these issues, we also want to make sure that the basic standards that we've developed for the security, for privacy, for safety, for you know, all of the things that we recognize the ethical development and use of these products are actually still complied with. And so it's just a question of figuring out what's the system that allows you to balance that appropriately in this context. So as we identified all of those issues that really are sort of aspects of the technological challenges, we also started to talk about the bureaucratic issues that are around. And you know, many of these are things that you see in different spaces, but are worth mentioning in particular in the context of the of machine learning and how we would be approaching TEVB. So the responsibility for machine learning is really shared. And what we found is that it's not well coordinated. And so as a consequence, what you find is that folks you know, in different services are learning lessons about this, but aren't necessarily sharing them across the enterprise. And that it's actually quite challenging to do that in an effective way. And even though there is some coordination from the Jake that there's a lot more that could be done, we think in this space and, and an opportunity for us to actually get better and use what we're learning more effectively across the system. And then also be able to deploy things more effectively across the system as an opportunity that would evolve out of that. DOD policy standards, metrics for testing and performance and evaluating the risk really need to evolve. This was another real main lesson that we learned from talking to people. And it's including on issues like what is acceptable risk for a given use case? How do we think about risk? And because testing, evaluation, verification, validation really is a risk management process. It's basically saying we have certain standards, we need to evaluate against them, but we are basically never gonna say that something is perfect, but we wanna evaluate it, make sure that it meets the standards that we believe are appropriate. But defining those can be quite hard and you know, across a range of issues, not just obviously in the context of machine learning, but in this case in particular, we saw some of the challenges that are presented here. And so having those kind of policies, standards, metrics for testing and performance is critical across a range of uh, technologies that are being used in the department. We also indicate that DOD lacks an iterative continuous approach to development testing and sustaining and sustainment that bridges the gap between acquisition and testing and evaluation. And again, we talk about the need for reiterative and, and iterative development and testing in this space because of what we found in the context of machine learning in particular and every learning system that's gonna be continuing to develop as it actually is deployed and change how it makes decisions and on what basis. And then we also talk about the fact that current TEVB methods and infrastructure really aren't well suited for machine learning and for deep learning and may require actually new funding approaches as a consequence. So we talk in, in some places about, you know, the need for new platforms, for cloud-based resources, for new computing support, particularly in deep learning, the data sets are just enormous and the need for actually developing testing facilities that allow us to go at those issues or will be critically important in the space so that we can actually compete. We also talk about the fact that we need the right talent and the right expertise and how challenging and important that is to actually see us develop appropriately in here. And it's not unrelated, frankly, to the fact that we need better coordination between DOD, the private sector, and academia, because there's so much that's going on across these different sectors and so much knowledge and experience that we can be drawing on, for example, from academia, not just about what those standards should be, but how to develop them, how to actually translate them, which is the final piece that I'll mention, which is how do you take the guidance and then translate it into basically your process for testing, evaluation, verification, and validation. And all of those different sectors can help us do that as we're going through this process. And one of the final things I'll just note that we, we learned in this is how 
you know, if you if you think of it, just take one example, the explainability issue, right? And recognize that um, you can actually design systems to improve explainability. You can do things like uh, set up a system so that it can tag data and do a variety of things so that you can actually um, track how a decision was made more effectively within that learning system, right? That can be helpful not only from a testing and evaluation perspective so that you can actually understand what went wrong in some respects or how the decision was made and the outcome that you see has been done, but it also can give you greater trust in the system and it can give you a better sense of how it is that you're going to develop it over time. And so those types of Thing, you know, those types of, of lessons that then get translated into standards for design and development and our testing and evaluation, if we're sharing those with the private sector and we're developing them in a way that actually makes sense and we're basing that on the knowledge, the research, the scholarship that's coming out of academia to support that, then we can actually promote those standards in ways that allow us to have a better sort of um, playing field more generally with, you know, the world. and. And that creates greater interoperability and that not having those standards worked through is one of the things that we heard from folks has been a real challenge in working this out. So I really, I'm going to hand it over to Michelle, my far better half on this project. So thank you. Avril, thanks. So um, Avril's done a great job of, you know, laying out the, the key findings of the report. Um, which was really a fascinating project for us. And let me just start by, I should have said from the beginning, thanking Open Philanthropies for their support of this work, but also CSET for being a tremendous partner in organizing this rollout and this discussion. So we tried in our recommendations to be really practical and pragmatic and concrete um, in things that the Department of Defense could you know, take action on to improve the approach to TEVV for, a, for machine learning and de de deep learning. So the first thing is, you know, this is gonna require much greater coordination across the TEVV ecosystem. So we started by recommending that the director of the Joint AI Center and the director of operational test and evaluation actually co-chair a new cross-functional team that would report regularly to the Deputy Secretary's Management Action Group, the DMAG, which is sort of the primary program and budget decision-making body in the department. And that they would really focus on coordinating TEVV research and investment across the department for AI and, and machine learning. So this body would spearhead the development of policy, standards, requirements, best practices for TEVV and would incorporate the key you know, AI ethics principles and directives around, uh, around it, um, serving as you know, uh, an opportunity for uh, uh, implementing testing guidance across the department. It would also, it could also be made responsible for assessing and certifying service AI and ML TEVV initiatives. Um, we think this body could create an action plan to delegate and coordinate responsibilities around the department. Um, so first, first recommendation is a coordination, a serious coordination body across the ecosystem. Second, we thought it's very important as a real noted to invest in research on new tools, methodologies, metrics that are key to implementing new testing frameworks and standards. Um, again, this will require coordinating and prioritizing research on the science of machine learning and deep learning to EVV backed by sustained and focused DOD funding. Um, we feel that this, this uh, cross-functional team should task, could task the Defense Science Board to conduct a thorough review of all current research programs in this space. And then based on that review, the committee could uh, uh, offer and develop a, a, co a coordinated research plan and actually seek funding for DARPA, the TRMC, and other service labs to carry out research. In the report itself, we made we highlighted a number of possible research areas, but in the interest of time, I will let you direct you to the report to go into those in detail. The third key recommendation was the, that this cross-functional uh, team should lead the development of a framework that establishes architecture and testing standards for TEVV. You really can't have a one-size-fits-all approach in this area. A DOD needs a, a flexible testing framework that is uh, mission and use case dependent. Um, this is also a framework that can and should incorporate DOD's legal and ethical requirements. 
Um, we think that the Defense Innovation Board AI pr uh, ethics principles um, uh, call on the Jake to create a taxonomy of DOD use cases for AI based on their ethical, safety, and legal risk considerations. And that the CFT, the cross-functional team, should actually leverage this technology and develop corresponding testing criteria and safety standards. Um, just as an example, if you had AI for business process automation, that would probably score pretty low on a risk criteria framework, while AI for critical network cybersecurity might score quite high, therefore necessitating stricter and more expansive TEVV requirements. For higher risk applications, DOD may need to require systems to be designed with fail-safe fail -safe systems or operated only as part of a human machine team to help mitigate risks and govern system performance. The fourth recommendation has to do with translating a testing framework into testable, verifiable requirements. Um, and we think that this is something that the DOD should create a process for, um, and that this would help standardize processes for industry contractors who develop AI for DOD and would promote a faster and cheaper TEVV process by enabling the private sector to do some of the testing throughout the development process. A fifth recommendation has to do with bridging the gap between development and testing. Um, as Avril noted, you know, machine learning and deep learning systems will require testing and verification across their entire life cycles. And this will require stronger links between program managers and testers, as well as methods to capture and share lessons learned throughout deployment. There are already a number of good models for how this could be done. For example, the developers for Project Maven needed to submit testing and evaluation in every, uh, uh, submit to, I'm sorry, testing and evaluation in every sprint cycle, or they couldn't move forward with the next stage of development. We were rec with this, this is the kind of approach that could be re replicated and scaled to, not to other programs. Um, Program managers, for their part, should be incentivized to build a test program that verifies performance throughout the development and fielding lifecycle and holds developers accountable for meeting those requirements. Our sixth main recommendation has to do with advancing TEVV uh, by requiring uh, substantial investment in both research and infrastructure, as Avril noted. Um, we thought the TRMC uh, would be uh, well positioned to lead an assessment of current gaps in infrastructure and should be given increased funding to invest in service and DOD TE, t &E live virtual and constructive test ranges, test beds, modeling and simulation for testing and adaptive systems. Um, we think that it would also behoove Congress to consider new types of funding authority that bridge the gap between AI s and 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 also testing and evaluation. There's, Congress has already done this. They've authorized a similar model for cyber in which funds are authorized uh, across testing, fielding, and operations. So we recommend that DOD working with Congress explore the potential of rec replicating this model for AI development and testing consistent with the DIBS uh, software acquisition and practices study recommendation for a single budget item for AI uh, and machine learning. Our seventh uh, recommendation is for DOD working with NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology and Industry, um, that they should develop a test, testing, uh, I'm sorry, they should develop standards for machine learning and deep learning testing for the private sector that can be publicly promoted and help inform private sector development of ML and DL systems. Such standards would focus on a range of issues, including things like robustness, interoperability, performance metrics, fail-safe design, traceability for data collection uh, and management and privacy and testability. Oh dear, I'm very sorry, I'm getting a lawnmower in the background and I've got the carpet cleaners inside. So I'm gonna try to uh, make a move um, inside. Uh, Michelle, if you like, we can move to the panel and uh, yes, you can slip in later. And catch up on the other recommendations uh, in the discussion. I'm so sorry. I think anybody who's offered eight recommendations has fulfilled a lot of the obligations. So thank you for that. Let's transition to the panelists uh, and we'll have time for questions from the floor.
to the panel as well, but uh, we, we have the benefit of three uh, very able participants, uh, Ashley Lawrence, who runs the, uh, the center at the Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, uh, the Intelligence Sen uh, System Center that's responsible for activities in these arenas. Ashley has a graduate degree in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana. Um, Jane Pinellas has been central to these activities at Jake before this, uh, before her present position, which is the responsibility for test and evaluation at the Jake. She was responsible for similar things for Project Maven, which as you know, was a pathbreaking project for the Department of Defense in this arena. And uh, Gabby Schaefitz is uh, co-author of this report, um, has been central to the work on this report. Uh, she is at uh, Westec, uh, West Exec Advisors. Uh, and before this uh, was among other things at the Senate uh, Foreign uh, Affairs Committee, um, working on Middle East and North Africa uh, issues. Gabby has a degree from the Kennedy School in Public Policy and an undergraduate degree in journalism before that. So thank you, the three of you for joining us. And um, in an uh, uh, untypical fashion, Michelle, who's now moved indoors. Um, Michelle, do you want to say more? Or do you want to put, I know you have a question for the panelists. You're going to have to unmute yourself to be effective. And Richard, if you don't mind my intervening for just a moment, as we transition to the Q&A, and I'm sure there are going to be a number of questions and comments, um, Richard will get to exercise the moderator's prerogative and kick off the Q&A himself. But meantime, if anyone would like to ask a question, please type it in the chat and it will be read aloud. Those who are phoning in for this meeting will not be able to ask questions and we thank you for understanding the technical limitations here. So. Back so over Michelle, to you, Richard, and the panel. Yeah. Michelle, you are the person in this large assemblage who now has the cleanest carpets. From that base, would you like to ask a question? This is the world. Or do you want to say more? No, I, I think that I'd refer people, the last three or four recommendations really have to do more with the workforce development and training the operators, tra you know, building the technical literacy of the workforce greater cooperation across the uh, national security community. So I'll refer you to the report for those, but I wanted to actually just ask both Jane and Ashley, as people who are true you know, techno technological leaders in this space to get their reactions to the report and its recommendations as a, as a way to start off the conversation. Jane, you wanna kick it off? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much for both having me here, but also for the opportunity to contribute my thoughts to the report to begin with. Um, I think test and evaluation of AI enabled systems is, um, it's certainly the most exciting thing I've done in my testing career. Uh, and we're really on the cusp of something unusual here because the DOD, instead of consuming methods um, that already exist, is kind of leading the development of, of some of these efforts. Um, I would say, you know, you, you touched on many points that are just extraordinarily important to us, and I appreciate that you're bringing them to our leadership's attention uh, at the DOD because uh, we're really at the point where developing these systems in some ways is easier and is going faster than testing these systems. Um, and we really want to avoid a situation where testing becomes a bottleneck, where testing prevents the warfighter from getting something that they need. Right, so um, just a few of the of the highlights of you know what I thought was most important. Uh, you know, when it comes to deep learning systems, they're fragile, right? And so th there is a chance that a small change in input can result in a large change in output, basically, right? And so it's harder to make that assurance case um, sometimes. Um, and you mentioned trust throughout the report. To me the importance of trust isn't necessarily to establish it as much as to quantify when and how much one should trust uh, the system, right? There's the right level of trust. We don't want the operator to trust the system too little where we actually increase the oper operator's workload. And we don't want the operator to trust the system too much where the operator perhaps stops paying attention. There is a right level of trust and trust really is a spectrum 
right? So maybe if the, if the operator has correctly calibrated their trust in the system and knows when the system works well and when it doesn't, then we might expect that operator to, to use that system to its advantages. Um, another uh, really important piece that, that you talked about is ethics. That's something we take very seriously at the Jake. Uh, we have a responsible AI uh, champions pilot. Um, I was able to participate in that. It's meant to mirror uh, similar training that Microsoft provides. And we're now going to undertake training the rest of the department on responsible use of AI. And we're uh, actually just starting the line of work where we're taking the five principles that the department um, adopted in February of this year, and we're trying to um, operationalize them in the sense that we're actually starting to test to them. Um, and we're going to find out kind of head on and learn from our own mistakes um, as far as the challenges that comes with it, right? Because as you correctly mentioned, there are, um, they're not going to be the same for every system, right? When we talk about the principle of, equi uh, of equitable, for instance, um, that principle is going to translate very different for a hiring model right, um, as opposed to a joint logistics kind of model. So um, that's a very interesting challenge, one that we've embraced at the Jake, um, and, but nevertheless, uh, a challenge ahead. Um, and then finally, um, you also, you, you mentioned a lot of, I think, really important things, but another one is the changes that are necessary to the DOD procurement process and the changes that are necessary to our acquisition process to actually make this happen, right? Because we are really, uh, both at the Jake and, and previously on Maven, what we were able to do is incorporate the users really early in the development stage and never let the users go. We were able to continuously incorporate their feedback. We were able to test iteratively and use testing to contribute to development. Um, and all of those processes are a little bit more difficult for standard programs of record in the DOD because there's this linear kind of testing stream where uh, we start with contractor test, follow with a developmental test and follow with an operational test. Um, and so I think deviating from that traditional strategy deviating from the way we've always done it in the DOD is always a challenge. Uh, but I think our leadership was aware of that challenge. Um, and so we're looking forward to, to pressing ahead with that. And then I'll, I'll finalize by saying, you know, we are working extensively with the Department of Operational Test and Evaluation. We're tied at the hip uh, for many things, in, including the test and evaluation framework for AI that we've created with the J, including um, how we are building uh, our contracts for t and &E, et cetera. So I uh, appreciate that recommendation. I think it's very important and happy to report that we're complying with it already. Over. All right, thanks, Jane. Um, I guess I'll pick up from there. Um, I'd love to just echo the thanks to Michelle, Avril, and, and Gabrielle for the excellent work on the report. I do feel like we need uh, somehow bring the, the policy conversations closer uh, to the technology and the nuances and the devils in the details. It's all about these nuances uh, and why these problems are hard. And I think you did a great job of capturing that. So thank you and thanks for the opportunity to weigh in. Uh, Jane made some great points, especially around some of the programmatics. I would love for folks to just leave with um, an intuition as to why this is hard, uh, why this is a hard problem. My own intuition around this area comes from, uh, I spent the early part of my career doing underwater robots with the Office of Naval Research and, and you know, working to, you know, 15 years ago, apply machine learning to, uh, you know, underwater sensing. And, you know, it's, it's, I can't, I can't tell you how nerve wracking it is to have this robot, you know, to be on the deck of a ship and to put it into the water and to know that it's got to fend for itself, um, you know, in the real world. And it's not, a factory floor. It's not that we can't engineer the environment for the system. The system has to work in the uncontrolled environment presented by the real world. And so what's hard about that, uh, you know, from a test and evaluation standpoint is, is context. It's all about context. And, you know, it, the way that robots uh, or AI systems, I say robots sort of colloquially, but you can understand that as an agent of any kind, cyber, um, just experiences context in a different way than we do. We, we experience context in a semantic way. I may say I don't drive as well at night uh, as I do during the day. Uh, you know, night and day, uh, rush hour, not rush hour, crowded, not so crowded. These are the ways we understand context. And understand a machine experiences context 
as you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of input variables, measurements, uh, and it's just not a one-to-one -one mapping. And so when we talk about test and evaluation, what we really wanna do is to understand how a system will perform in, in these different contexts where they're really kind of not well described and not well matched to our intuitions. Uh, and as Jane pointed out, the, the goal is not necessarily always to build trust. It's, we use this word, calibrate trust. Um, that is, how much should I trust a system given the context? Uh, and, you know, uh, one distinction I think is important is this notion of a system that incorporates machine learned components versus a learning system, right? So I just want to point out, we're still on the first one, <laughs> trying to figure out how to do the T&E for that. That is, we may have a system that's not learning as it's deployed, continuing to reprogram itself as it's deployed. Um, uh, the lights in the room here, motion sensing. I'll have to get up in a moment. Oh, there we go, <laughs> turn it back on. Um, so uh, it's not that, uh, that the systems we're fielding today are continuing to reprogram themselves as they're deployed, uh, but that they involve these, uh, they incorporate these uh, components that were learned through machine learning and so are more difficult and opaque uh, to understand. But the learning system I think we need to create is the organizational systems you're making uh, reference to. The, the DOD itself needs to become the learning system uh, as it pertains to, to, to fielding uh, intelligent systems. That is, you know, every time I, 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 I was quoted on this in your report, uh, but you know, the way I think of it is every time we put one of these systems into the world, it's like a kind of experiment where we're learning something about how that system will perform in a given context. And it's our organizational intelligence that needs to learn about that and propagate that knowledge over time. The last thing I want to say is just this notion of, you know, centralized versus decentralized, uh, you know, building a repository of knowledge and tools that are centralized in some way, but then need to be able to be flexibly applied in a decentralized way. And so one of the things we need to kind of figure out is when we get this repository of tools and uh, we validate them uh, to verify them and validate them against some envisioned use case, how much, of that uh, how much of that assurance is inherited for a given operator at the edge incorporating that tool um, into their workflow in a certain way? Um, and when does that system need to be re-verified and revalidated? You know, how far, you know, as that, as that use case gets farther and farther away from, uh, you know, what was envisioned? And so there's a lot to talk about here. I don't want to take more than my time, but again, just trying to, to help folks to kind of walk away with an intuition for the space, why it's hard and hopefully where we need to head. Well, these are terrific points. I particularly like your point, Ashley, about the need for us to learn and it being an experiment as we put out there. But it seems to me to raise a very fundamental problem for all of us, which is amidst the really quite remarkable and Herculean level of effort in the report to get our arms around this and to suggest good ways to proceed. Aren't we doomed to a significant number of failures? And what does that do to trust in this context? One question that as a subsidiary matter might come up is what kind of contingency plan, if any, have you in the real world, Jane, or you in thinking about this, Michelle and Gabby and Avril and Ashley, not to imply you're not in the real world, but uh, to what extent have we thought about that contingency and what it means for where Avril started us off, which is uh, our ability to maintain trust? Do any of you want to speak to that? Jane, I saw you nodding. Do you want to start and we'll, we'll pile on? So I, I, I want to make sure I understand contingency correctly here, but if we're talking about the idea of basically some kind of a fail safe or a guardrail, which is how I'm taking this question, then that's actually um, incorporated in one of the ethics principles, right? So one of them is the principle of governability, a principle that's designed to protect us from unintended consequences of these systems. I think what I'm saying, Jane, is that that's exactly a very laudable and high priority aim, and it's impossible to achieve across the board. That in fact, uh, we will not be able to keep these systems from as they develop in a self-guided way from absorbing new data and the like, from going awry in a number of cases. And I'm asking whether you agree with that. And if we agree with it, how we account for what our contingency plan is. Sure, so, so I'll, I'll answer your question somewhat and then I'll answer it with a question. <laughs> 
Um, and, and basically, I'll, I'll say the following. So first of all, we're not yet um, at the point really of, of fielding systems that, that learn in that way that we think might kind of get out of control in, in any kind of meaningful way. Um, when we talk about designing systems that have kind of a fail safe or guardrail type mode, which is um, an, an important goal, right? And again, it's consistent with our ethical principles. So of course we'll design systems that way. Um, one thing I'll point out about that, that is that it doesn't actually make testing easier, right? So people tend to think of it, well, if we can, if there's a turn off button, um, then perhaps testing of the system becomes easier. It doesn't because now we also have to test that button um, in addition to everything else, right? So there's that. And I will, um, I will add to this challenge, the challenge of, there, there are two additional challenges here at least that I can think of. One is the ability of the human to actually notice any kind of emergent behavior, right? In time to, to react to it. And a related challenge that doesn't come up enough is the emergent behavior of the human piece, right? So because what we're doing now is we're frequently designing ways to automate or create some kind of tools that help the human. Um, and it's important for us to, in addition to that, account for the way that the human's behavior might, might emerge as well um, and could still be consistent with the ethical principles and still be consistent with the way that the system was meant to be used. I wonder if a different kind of test and evaluation is required, one that looks more like audit uh, with its recurring expectations that there will be deviations, but our aim is to actually catch them and learn from, from that. Is that ring true? There's some research on the way already. Um, and I, I know some of it is actually at the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins. There's some research at Carnegie Mellon as well that um, essentially allows the model to evaluate itself in a way, right? And kind of perhaps alert the user to say, hey, I'm no longer good enough that you should be relying on me in this situation. I'm not meant to be used in this domain, for instance. Uh, so those are all important elements. Again, very much consistent with um, the ethical principles, in this case, the traceability principle, which includes auditability. Uh, but it has much to do with the way that these systems are built and developed, uh, which is actually, at this point, still largely out of our control. Sandy Barsky, who's worked on these issues at GSA and is in the audience, has written in asking about blockchain as a potential way of dealing with this evolving need for assessment and audit. Uh, Ashley, do you, uh, Jane commented on the uh, Hopkins APL efforts in this arena. Do you want to comment on this idea and for that matter on Jane's observations? Uh, well, I'm not an expert on on blockchain. I mean, I can I can talk to uh, some of the technologies that Jane was referencing. Uh, there there is uh, one technology, for example, that does runtime uh, assurance and monitoring for for systems. Uh, one one of the things that's that's hard that, that people don't realize is hard is actually uh, safely testing autonomous systems on a test range. And until recently, we haven't really had technologies to safely test technologies on the range. And so TRMC was mentioned, APL has got some research projects that have come to fruition and been transitioned to the Air Force and other places that actually do this kind of onboard uh, monitoring. And the idea is you can have uh, sophisticated AI that maybe you don't quite know how to do the V and V for um, that's nominally flying the plane or otherwise driving the system, but you've got this simpler robot is essentially or autonomy that you can uh, make some assurances about. And that's basically maintaining uh, a geofence or maintaining a safe uh, flight profile uh, or other, other things. As Jane mentioned, it's not, it's not magic. You still have to figure out how many of these fail safe conditions you want to program in and how you're going to verify against those Another technology I wanted to mention, and this goes back to Avril's comment about the simulation to reality gap, the sim to real gap. And I, you know, getting, getting statistical significance in real world tests is really hard. I mean, real world tests take time and they're expensive. And so one of the things we need to do is try to better understand how, what we can learn from running millions and millions of trials in simulation, which is in, relatively inexpensive, how can we do that to pick out just a handful of real world tests that we're going to run and, and learn the most from? 
And so technologies, T and E technologies that address the SIM to real gap are another uh, family of technologies that I think are, are, are very important. I, I could go on, but why don't I stop there to make sure uh, uh, we, we follow the direction you, you want to take us in, Richard. And I still didn't, I still didn't do the blockchain thing. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Uh, although you have show that you're not really a Washington resident when you think you need expertise to speak on the subject. Um, Gabby, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to uh, bring this up a level beyond the kind of technical uh, to the broader kind of policy and conversation and questions that we speak to in the report. And I think Ashley and Jane both alluded to. So first is, if I understood the question it was about just levels of uncertainty and will it be too great that we cannot deploy these systems or it won't be worth it to do so. And I think we tried to make the point that um, Avril really alluded to that this is first and foremost about risk management and providing decision makers with information uh, to make those calculuses. So if you have a better understanding of the different levels of uncertainty and trying to parse those out so that you can get ahead of some of the deployment of these systems um, for the types of capabilities that are less uncertain, um, but are still kind of upholding our, our values and doing so in a manner that's oper operationally relevant. Um, and so the first point is about, is the need for a testing framework that breaks out the different categories of uncertainty that is use case and mission dependent. And if we can have a better granularity and we don't take a one size fit all approach, yes, I acknowledge that there is still some uncertainty and perhaps we determine that there are use cases uh, or certain systems or classifications of systems that are too, um, too uncertain in the current moment, but I think that we can get ahead in certain areas. And then the second, um, and this is the point that I believe Ashley was just making, is talking about, um, governing and fail safes and, and concepts of when a system will fail and won't um, and using that as a way to build trust. So one of the points we make in the report is that an operator doesn't always need to know why a system works, but when it will and will not work. And obviously there are tremendous challenges and we're still in the early days of research to even be able to do that. But I do think by bounding some of that uncertainty, even if you can't diminish it, you can get ahead of some of the challenges of building and calibrating uh, operational trust in a manner that allows a certain class of systems to be deployed sooner uh, and take advantage of some of those um, attributes uh, to advance DOD's objectives. So I, I want to move to another subject and a question from the audience, but uh, I would just observe that uh, I think one of the virtues of the report is uh, it's for, and of this discussion and these comments is its focus on trust and not just achievement of accuracy. And trust is especially important for a new technology. My general rule of thumb is we trust all technologies we were born that, that existed when we were born and we grew up with. And anything after that, we tend to be very skeptical about and uneasy with. Um, in that context, one of the things I worry about is that we can't provide anything like complete assurance. And we need to prepare for instances in which uh, our systems miscarry. And uh, that involves important aspects of our test and evaluation system, which reassures people but it also involves planning for that contingency. And uh, that's just something that I, I would emphasize. Taking this in a different direction, we, get a, we have a question um, from Maureen Tucker uh, who asks about the international implications of this. And specifically she asks, do you recommend that the US advocate for a set of internationally adopted norms or seek a legally binding treaty governing the application of AI in military systems? I'll jump in on that one. It's a great question. And I think the international dimension is so important because we are at the early stages where we can try to shape the landscape, um, especially with regard to competitors who may not take the ethical considerations as seriously as we do. Um, so I do think certainly trying to um, use our, our own sense of AI ethics and norms and principles as a basis for starting a series of international discussions to determine whether we can actually build consensus around a set of norms. Perhaps a formal uh, tree, perhaps not. Um, I don't know if that's a bridge too far enough. I think we should certainly start down the road of the conversation. 
And even if there are countries like China or Russia or Iran who may never sign on, the fact that if you get the bulk of the international community signing on, that can be very powerful if in fact there are violations in the future. The other critical international conversation that we didn't quite get to is um, leveraging the work of NIST to actually have an international conversation about standards um, and how we're, how we're approaching this whole challenge of testing and evaluation and, and verification and validation. Um, and then the last international dimension that we really have to pay attention to is, you know, it's the old adversary gets a vote. When we field these systems in a DOD context, particularly a, you know, any kind of contest or conflict, we have to assume that the adversary will try to poison the data, manipulate the system, cause it to fail, cause it to misfire. And so one of our recommendations that I didn't get to was having DOD and the, I, and the internet uh, intelligence community really invest in some red teaming to look at how adversaries might try to undermine, poison, manipulate, change our, our, uh, the ML and DL systems that we rely on um, and try to anticipate and get ahead of some of those. But I think this, the international dimensions are very, very important and um, uh, needs to be factored into the agenda along with what we need to do ourselves. Can I add to that too? I, um, and, and first of all, I would expect this question from Maureen Tucker, who's an institution at Georgetown University and a wonderful woman. I, this is um, just to, to highlight one aspect of what Michelle said that I think is frequently underestimated in terms of its value is the standards piece that she noted. And I, you know, here, I think there's just a whole series of different ways in which you might think about this. I, um, while you wouldn't necessarily put standards into an international treaty, the reality is if, if NIST is promoting certain standards that we think are appropriate, those standards can help to create greater transparency about essentially these systems. They can help to identify um, and allow us to identify when we're using these systems, just how reliable they are, how safe, secure, all of these other pieces. They can help us basically um, uh, promote the development of systems that we can more easily test and evaluate, verify and validate ultimately. And, um, and they can essentially level the playing field in this space in a way that it's very hard to do otherwise. And, you know, as you pointed out, Richard, I think, and I agree with you, like, you know, the technologies you're born with, like, you just trust more. And these are new technologies. And there's a consequently, uh, you know, a lot of concern about what does that mean and how do we evaluate them and, and how do we trust them and so on. If you, um, if we rush too quickly, which is, you know, a, a natural thing to do, um, then, you know, we may end up developing things and pushing them out before we properly test, evaluate them and understand them. And in that process can actually hurt our, the legitimacy of the technology and our capacity to use it more effectively in the future because of mistakes or things that happen as a consequence of that technology being used in ways that, that produce unexpected and consequential events. And, uh, and I think you know, one of the, the aspects of standard producing um, work, which you know, is not the sexiest thing in the world, but is utterly critical to actually evaluating and, and, and pushing forward in a technology, uh, its development in a responsible way. I think is that uh, you actually then can benefit from that technology for far more in the future over time as you build that trust through the standards that you create. And you also, by doing it internationally, can put our you know, private sector, our public sector, the folks that are working in these areas in a space where they aren't um, uh, essentially, um, you know, where, they, where they're put at a disadvantage because they're complying with the standards that we require and that we think are necessary for security and safety and privacy and ethical requirements while the rest of the world isn't and i think that's part of promoting those standards internationally is actually saying these are standards that you're going to want because actually this is going to make the technology far more effective for you ultimately without some of the negative consequences that might otherwise arise in your paper, you comment that the uh, intelligence agencies seem to be ahead of DOD and we have lessons we can learn from them. Can you all comment on what kinds of things uh, the intelligence agency experience 
teaches us, or for that matter, the opportunities from uh, the use of AI in the financial stock exchange kind of arena, what have we learned from that experience? A number of questions from the audience relate to those kinds of issues. What have we learned already from our experience with AI? Well, I feel like I've talked too much and I know Gabby has a great answer to this. So I wonder if she'd like to answer this. Gabby, okay. do you want to go first and then let Avril? I'll go, I'll go first on the industry piece um, and then perhaps kick it over to Avril. So first, as you mentioned, I think there are some interesting lessons to be learned from the financial sector that's used um, AI and machine learning, both for big data collection and aggregation, and then also automation um, and trading. And so on the first piece, I know that the financial sector has uh, experimented with different types of offerings and using AI to uh, aggregate big data, test uh, new configurations, um, and use models to simulate how users would respond to new products or services. And they do so with virtual and automated testing. Um, and I think that links very nicely to a concept that we talk about the need for more automated repeatable testing to um, implement um, a DevSecOps approach, this continuative, continual iterative and automated testing and development cycle to keep up with the pace of private sector development. So we talk about in the report, the need to use modeling and simulation, digital twins, um, virtual and simulated constructed environments to help keep up with the pace of this development and do this um, testing work more quickly. And so I think that that's one lesson. The second um, is I know that there have been some challenges in the financial sector related to uh, the interactions between models and the production of flash crashes. And I think here we allude to the challenge in our report about the need to deal with the interactions within a system that AI and machine learning will be um, embedded within a system of systems. And we need to take a systems integrated approach to understanding and testing and evaluating those models. So understanding those interactions, but also interactions between AI enabled systems and particularly in the worst case between adversaries uh, and the need to understand the interactions um, and how those uh, could impact strategic stability and going back to the prior conversation, perhaps what standards could be put in place to mitigate some of those risks. But I do think uh, even more than the financial sector, which I think is a really good use case where there's also um, autonomous vehicle companies that are doing a lot of work in the sector and really leading the charge. And again, I think we encourage uh, in this effort to link DOD and industry more closely, DOD to really look at some of those private sector best practices in the autonomous vehicle sector, uh, particularly around issues of synthetic, synthetic data and again, modeling and simulation so that you can do this process faster um, and expand the range of environments and conditions in which you are testing these systems to try to get at some of those questions of brittleness versus robustness, the testing the bounds of system performance um, and some of the other challenges we've already spoken to. If I can build on, on some things that Gabrielle said, um, in addition, and these are all excellent points, but I think a couple of other areas where we're looking to, to borrow knowledge from our um, industry partners, at least at the Jake, has been certainly the automotive industry, because I think it's one of the few industries that approaches uh, the level of uh, consequence, right, if, if, so, if something goes awry. Um, to that of what we do in the DOD. Uh, but then also um, when it comes to financial institutions, another interest aside from the things that Gabrielle already mentioned, um, in the financial industry, the idea of equitability, bias and explainability, especially when it comes to lending um, and being able to measure exactly how models were trained, how does that translate to the types of people that um, the model might suggest are good or bad to lend to and what kind of biases that might lead to? There's a lot of good work in the financial industry um, as far as equitability and unintended bias. Um, and so we're looking to learn from them about that as well. Okay. We have a question from the audience, Jane, about uh, the uh, experience that we've gotten so far with respect to the use of AI on aviation maintenance. Uh, you want to talk about that and what we've learned from that? 
Uh, sh sure. So at the Jake, uh, we, we have a line of effort that has to do with uh, uh, predictive maintenance, basically. Um, and in our specific case, uh, it had to do with predicting when uh, an engine on a helicopter might have a hot start and therefore fail. Uh, this was one of the earliest projects that the Jake undertook. And so, you know, internally, we had a lot of kind of kind of issues. It was learning on our own mistakes when it came to that product. Ultimately, though, I'm, I'm very happy to report that uh, the product has been fielded. Um, and in fact, uh, recently, there, there was a situation where the model predicted a hot start, a helicopter was, um, was uh, pulled aside instead of used and further investigation, um, you know, in fact, did reveal a mechanical issue. Um, and so that was a very tangible uh, kind of win for us where we were able to say our model actually did something that potentially prevented somebody from getting hurt. I suppose a thought that runs through my mind is that uh, there's something unfair about what we're doing with respect to AI. If we um, had some virgin circumstance where nothing existed and I came along and said, I've got a great idea, let's have human beings go out there and run all kinds of military operations. I think we would immediately fall to a thousand observations about difficulties associated with it, the difficulties of controlling those individuals, the degree to which we have trouble tracking what they've done, et cetera. And what we've done over time is to build an extraordinary apparatus, a whole set of things that involve mechanisms of control in the military world that effectively we have to create in the, in the context of AI. And test and evaluation is a crucial part of that, but it can't do it all alone. It needs to rely on other mechanisms. Does that uh, resonate for you all as I say this, or does it seem to you to be misleading? No, I think that, um, I, Richard, I think your point is, is spot on. And um, I forget, this point was probably made several times, but I think we need to be taking a full life cycle approach um, a full approach across the technology life cycle um, in terms of assurance. And it's got to start with research and the kinds of research we're conducting to design and understanding that all of our intelligence systems are part of human, uh, human workflows. And so how do we take the human into account to development uh, and tests and, and uh, in this iterative uh, kind of development uh, that we're talking about? So I do think this has to be... Um, you know, a full, a full life cycle engagement in terms of the tech life cycle. I also think this goes back a little bit to an earlier point about, you know, creating this learning system, the DOD as an, a learning system, our organization. And I think we need to contextualize failures. This goes back to your point, Richard, you know, and, and, the, and the point about the, you know, the self-driving car industry. Every time there is an accident, the story is the failure. And it never, it never for me, I mean, it's always a tragedy. Uh, but it never answers the question that's on my mind, which is how good are we doing in, in, a, in a holistic sense? How many safe miles have we driven? Uh, and, and how is this failure tally um, trading off against those? And I think if the failure or if these individual failures are the story, then I think we're, we're going we're gonna to wind up getting shut down early. Um, so I do think we have to figure out, you know, we have to come in with the idea that we're going to be failing we have to properly contextualize those failures so that we can learn from them uh, and, and, and keep going. Uh, Gabby, are there things we haven't touched on with uh, just a few minutes before we need to close that you would particularly like us to address or that you wanna uh, say something about? I think the one other issue that we haven't touched on extensively that I think I really learned a lot about through our discovery process. And I think it's particularly important because it bridges uh, the culture and institutional and policy issues with the technology is how we think about certifying human machine teams that it will be a walk, crawl, run approach. And that first and foremost, we are most likely to deploy these systems as part of human machine teams and perhaps forever in particular cases where we've determined that the risk is far too great uh, to have these systems operating autonomously. And I think that, that um, this has been touched on a bit. We first need to think about what are the interactions between the machine and the system? How can they benefit or detract from each other? What will the interactions between them look like and the consequences they produce? 
Um, and in doing so, think about how you train and certify these teams as a whole and as a system. And so thinking about um, things like far greater wargaming and experimentation that integrates this technology. How do you think about training and certifying operators for specific use cases? How do you think about retraining or recertifying as either the technology or the mission changes? And so I think there's this whole basket of issues um, that we begin to uh, at least identify in the report is important, but needing far more work. And I think being um, the first area where we are likely to see these systems roll out and incredibly important uh, to do so. We have a question, uh, Jane, uh, from uh, Liz Sherwood, a former Deputy Secretary of Energy, who particularly was interested in the ways in which small changes in input can have disproportionate impacts in output and the challenges associated with that. I don't know if you want to comment any further uh, with regard to that in our closing minutes. Um, I, I can certainly, um, I, and it illustrates, you know, that comment in general just illustrates uh, one of the biggest difficulties uh, for, for us testers when it comes to machine learning models that come to us as a black box, whether they're deep learning models or, 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 or if they're more shallow. The, the problem is that as a tester, my instinct is to design my test um, knowing uh, causal relationships right between, uh, between variables that affect the system performance and the ultimate system performance. And then as an experimenter, as a tester, I design a test to vary those variables in the way that they would vary naturally operationally. And I evaluate system performance as a function of those parameters. Um, when it comes to either you know, machine learning or, or any other system, frankly, that would come to us as a black box, and particularly uh, when it comes to deep learning um, type, syst uh, type systems, uh, what is worrisome is that we don't know necessarily the set of parameters that makes the system performance change, right? And then it becomes more and more difficult for us as testers to design a series of experiments and to build up that assurance case over time um, because we just don't know those causal relationships. Um, and, and so there has to be a requirement of auditability or some kind of predictability at least, right? So I, I have to be able to know on some level and the warfighter has to be able to know that if I change the input in a certain way, the output changes in a certain way. Um, that's a very basic level of, of, of trust uh, or explainability that, that we kind of hope for with a warfighter. Uh, and we need to know again, how that predictability changes as a function of these variables. Does that answer the question? I hope so. well, uh, well, it certainly speaks to it. I'm, I'm sorry, Michelle, did you want to say something or were you? I have one last point I want to make when you're, when you're ready. Oh, okay, I just would, would observe, I, I think your, your comments are quite, quite apt. I'm just struck by the magnitude of the effort associated with the test and evaluation and verification kinds of efforts. They seem larger and difficult to reconcile with the acceptability of the establishment, which is so heavily invested in, will give us operational payoffs. And you rightly, I think Jane nicely talked about, our goal is not to create bottlenecks, but let this proceed rapidly and richly. But I would think that the test evaluation verification world will create demands of such large degree that uh, it'll be hard to balance the books here and achieve the progress that, that we want to achieve. You look, Jane, as though you want to say something about that. I don't mean to, to burden you with it though, if, uh, if others want to comment. That's okay, I feel like I've spoken too much already. Do others want to comment on this? Yeah, I, I'm happy to try. I, and. Um... But I think you're right, Richard, this is one of the critical issues that, you know, and Jane alluded to it, I did too, like in, and you said, if we, if we end up with a, a T and E, V and V, you know, system that is ultimately so cumbersome that it, you know, by the time we get products through it, right, they are no longer current, they're obsolete, and we've lost the edge of innovation and competitiveness, then that's obviously a huge challenge. One of the things that I think, you know, um, we, we 
indicate in the report and, and that certainly we learned and heard from others is that there's a lot of um, work that can be done, right? Like, so um, to actually avoid that scenario while still actually having a T and E V and B system that works, right? And among them are as follows. Like, so one is um, if you do actually have standards that you're trying to reach and everybody understands what DOD standards are and how they're gonna be testing and evaluating these uh, products, then the private sector can actually do a fair amount of the work before it even gets to the D to DOD. And since so much of the innovation is coming through that process, that actually can be a very useful thing for us to have essentially communicated and for that to be part of the process, right? Second piece is that if we're sharing across the services and there's a coordinated effort to actually deal with this more generally, then we can have lessons learned so that there's a fair amount that's been you know, done before you actually get to the next level of innovation in a sense in these spaces. So there's a whole series of things that can be done across the things. So, you know, Ashley's point about the simulation piece, how much can we do through simulation before we actually have to do a field test or you know, what, how can we minimize that in ways that do? And I think part of the challenge is that we recognize this is a space where we really are gonna have to develop standards that meet the policy expectations that we have for these systems. We're gonna have to get to a point where we trust them sufficiently given the enormous opportunities that they offer and what they can do to solve some of the challenges that we see and for us to be competitive. All of these reasons, they're critical, right? Like, so can we do this in a way that actually promotes, you know, innovation as opposed to stifling it through the process? But I, I mean, so it's a problem, there's no question, but there are, I think, some ways to address it is I guess all I'm saying. Michelle, you get the last word. Thank you. I just wanted to footstop something that is critical to just about you know, imp being able to implement every recommendation we make in this report is um, the human capital piece. I mean, unfortunately, Jane's and Ashley's don't grow on trees. You know, these these are <laughs> these uh, people with your kind of skills are far too rare. And to do this well, we're going to have to bring into the department people with deep academic grounding, not only in test and evaluation, but systems engineers, computer scientists, ML, ML uh, experts that understand the technology itself. You need statisticians, data scientists, applied mathematicians to do the mathematical piece. You need experts who understand human machine interaction, as well as psychologists and ethicists. So there's just a huge, um, work to be done to build the kind of workforce we need. Not all of those folks will be able to be in the department itself, but we cert the department certainly needs to do a better job of, of recruiting, developing, offering promotion and career paths to uh, technologists, uh, both in the military and on the civilian side. And there where, and then you need to also double down on the partnerships, partnerships with places like, you know, APL, um, partnerships with the FFRDCs, with universities that are developing and, and sort of hotbeds of that kind of talent. Um, but I just think the human capital strategy aspect of this is absolutely foundational to getting any of the rest of this done. And so I just wanted to foot stomp that as something where I think we can make meaningful progress if we focus on it. And I just would uh, conclude this by uh, offering a reason that I think I, I particularly value the work the three of you did in producing this study and uh, why the work that Jane uh, and, uh, and uh, Ashley have, are doing something so important. Gabby mentioned that uh, we can learn among other things from the self-driving cars and the efforts in that context. And I think it's absolutely right. What's so striking is that when we have a variety of difficulties developing self-driving cars and we move more slowly than was expected five years ago, um, we just move more slowly. And uh, that's wonderful from a societal standpoint, even though it's frustrating to not move more rapidly. But in the national security realm, I believe that what's gonna happen is that because others will move as fast as they can, we'll get dragged along whether we're ready or not in our testing and our validation and in our assurance of the safety of these mechanisms. And we will be unable really to go as slowly as good sense would have it. 
And if that's the case, then it becomes all the more important to think about the kinds of things that you, Michelle Avril, and, uh, uh, and as well Gabriel, uh, have developed in your, in your paper. Um, it's easy to, as I am doing, criticize it and raise issues about the difficulty. But the reality is um, we've got to do the best we can with this because we're not going to be able to put it aside. Coming to grips with that is central. And we all owe real thanks to all five of you for your work in this arena and to CSEP for sponsoring this, this event. We look forward to some future CSEP proposals. But in the meantime, thank you. And uh, thank you all in the audience. And my apologies to the 450 of you who so I was unable to draw questions from. That's all right. They'll come back for more later on, Richard. Thank you. On behalf of CSET, I'd like to thank our featured speakers, Michelle Flournoy and Avril Haynes, for taking part in today's event, along with their co-author, Gabrielle Shevitz, and other panelists, Jane Pinellas and Ashley Lawrence, and moderator Richard Danzig. Many thanks as well to all of you for attending and for your thought-provoking questions. Once again, the report is linked on CSET's website in the page corresponding to this event. We'll also place a link in our follow-up email. And we will soon share news of our next event. In the meantime, we appreciate your being with us here today. Stay safe, and we hope to see you again, if only virtually, real soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you to see you. Take care.